Welcome back, everybody. We are in our afternoon session of Baltimore Data Week, third day of Data Week. Um, some of you are stalwarts. We've seen you every session, and some of you are brand new, so welcome to everybody. Uh, my name is Seema Iyer, and I oversee the Baltimore Neighborhood Indicators Alliance. Uh, we're going to give a brief introduction about what we are doing, and in the meantime, if you want to fill out the poll, of who you are and where you live and uh, what sector of the economy you represent. Um, the Baltimore Neighborhood Indicators Alliance is part of the National Neighborhood Indicators Partnership, which is hosted by the Urban Institute, a learning network of over 30 cities around the country. Baltimore was actually the sixth entry into this net network back in 1999, 2000. Um, and our all of our jobs are try to put data in the hands of communities and make sure everybody has access to equal information. Uh, and that's what we've been doing for 20 years. And so our signature project is the Vital Signs Report. Every year we put out a, over 100 different indicators for the 55 communities that you see on this map. So that's 5,500 data points that we put out every year. And 20 years, you can do the math and how much data we have on this website for you to kind of track change over time over a wide variety of topics from demographics to sustainability to crime and safety and all kinds of other things. So um, that's what we do. You're gonna learn much more about that over the course of this whole week. We've been kind of talking about different projects that we have on the Vital Signs Project, but then tomorrow morning at uh, Friday, uh, either in person or virtually, you'll be able to see a deeper dive into what we found with the 2020 census and the 2020 vital signs data that we put out. Like I said, today is, uh, we're, we're on day three uh, in the afternoon session. We're excited to have our afternoon panelists um, joining us today. And then tomorrow we are in person at the University of Baltimore. We can put the link in the chat to see if you haven't signed up already either um, virtually or in person. We'd love to see you tomorrow. Uh, learn much more about the Vital Signs Report and then a panel of great um, speakers tomorrow morning. And then in the afternoon, we have the Data Unconference. We have people that have pitched their own ideas to lead conversations and everybody in the audience will be able to vote for which one they want to listen to. And it's uh, literally democratization of data discussions. <laughs> and that's a little bit about our, uh, our mission. So today um, we have Nika Namdi speaking from Fight Flight Be More. And just to let her know who's in the audience, um, I'm gonna end this poll so you all can see who's here. Uh, we have a lot of people that live and work in the city, 47%. Uh, we have a lot of people that don't live or work in the city, 32%. And then um, we have folks here from nonprofit organizations, government, student education, and community members. Uh, so welcome you all. And just so that she also sees much more about you, feel free to put in the chat your name, your organization affiliation, why you're here, who you are, uh, so that she gets to see all of the wonderful people that are in our virtual room. Uh, and we'll try and keep it as interactive as possible. And I am going to turn it over to Nika and her bio is going to be in the chat as well. Thanks so much, Nika, for being here. You are, I don't know, you've been to Data Week for um, many years now. So uh, welcome back to Data Week. Thank you, Dr. Iyer, for having me. And I'm just trying to get this set up because I like to see people's faces um, when I'm talking. So that, yeah, because I don't need to see these slides. As you might imagine, I've seen these slides 100 times. All right, so uh, again, good afternoon and greetings to everyone. I'm Nika Nambi. I am the creator of Fight Light Be More and the co-creator of the Stop, a co-creator of the Stop Oppressive Seizures Fund. And just for a little housekeeping, if you have questions during, during the presentation, please drop them in the chat. I'm gonna try to stop myself um, at the 20 minute mark so that we can have some discussion, dialogue, answering of questions. Um, I'm about to try to give a, what could be an all day presentation 
in, in, in 20 minutes. So forgive me if I push through um, with a little bit of speed. But Fight Like Be More is our um, social, uh, economic, environmental justice initiative aimed at remediating blight in community and the Stop Oppressive Seizures Fund, which comes out of that work, help, seeks to help us disrupt, dismantle, and decolonize our uh, understanding and policy decisions and practical and pro programmatic decisions surrounding real, what we call real property. Uh, but today I'm really presenting on, or I shouldn't say but, and today I'm really presenting on this notion of developing a coalition surrounding community stewardship or control of the land um, and the structures and to a certain degree, the institutions that are in and support community. Our notion of community development really centers on the idea that it's not about the structures, it's not about buildings, it's not about, um, you know, all of those kind of things that we uh, tend to think about when we say community development, but that's really real estate development. What we're talking about is developing the, the people, bonds, the institutions and entities that support us living and thriving in, to, in community to, together. And one of the major impediments to both community control of land and to us living in healthy, thriving communities is blight. And it's also um, the policies that have contributed to and created, created blight. And so in our, our attempt to develop this coalition of residents, resident organizations, community groups um, to create a framework, we have to take a little bit of a deep dive into how we got here, right? So when we talk about blight, we talk, we're talking about the presence, especially in concentration of vacant, abandoned, dilapidated, underutilized and misutilized properties and community. And they show up that Light shows up as a number of different property related issues, some of which you see um, listed in front of you. And so we're trying to build a co coalition around addressing those issues. But how did we get here? So Baltimore is an old world um, industrial city. We have a working port. We have we had a railroad, railroad very early. Um, and because of that, along with the horrible institution of enslavement, Baltimore is, um, has a long, a long history of housing um, issues, of property issues, but it starts with how the city was situated. You can see in the little thatch mark area, that is the original, what they call Baltimore town of the 16 and 1700s. And we start to see it grow, right? We see in 1907, uh, in 1817, the extension of Baltimore's northern border to what is actually North Avenue. Um, and we begin to see it, we continue to see it grow through the 18, through the 1800s to the extension of uh, the western border of the city to, you know, the bridge that now connects uh, one side of Edmondson Avenue to the other via via Lincoln Park. But it's important, more important than the physical geography is to note that Baltimore, that people lived, worked, um, socialized initially around the water in communities that were um, multiracial uh, in general, but um, ethnically specific on the block level. That's why people, one block, to the next block in Baltimore, even today, you could see two totally different, um, could have two totally different vibes. Um, so you may have had um, enslaved people living alongside free people of, of color. You also might have had in the next block, people who are Scots, Irish, in the next block, you might have people who consider themselves native born to, to America. Um, but over time, those, uh, black level ethnic enclaves developed into more pronounced racial um, 
neighbor, racially segregated neighborhoods. And, and there's a long history of that that culminates in the codification of housing segregation, uh, otherwise known as Ordinance 610 in the early um, 19 aughts. And that opens the door. Baltimore's a city of a lot of firsts, whether it's the first public market, the first housing court, uh, the first housing segregation ordinance. Um, some of my folks in St. Louis, which is a city very much like Baltimore, will argue that they had restrictive covenants before we did. Um, and many people in Baltimore will argue it is the other way around. So Baltimore is a city of many firsts and many of them are not so um, not so good when it comes to this notion of um, housing um, and, and healthy and thriving communities. So you, you, in addition to the population growth and the political um, changing dynamics surrounding race, you see that by 1912, there's a proposal to expand Baltimore even larger in, in those in the, into those yellow areas. And that went to a state um, level ref, ref, referendum by which folks got to vote about whether Baltimore City could port, um, annex those portions of Baltimore County you see in yellow. And almost explicitly along um, racial lines and almost explicitly about the notion of race, that referendum failed. And so Baltimore, there's an article called Baltimore Seals Its Border. Baltimore literally sealed its border um, as a municipal jurisdiction at that time. And so as we see, as Baltimore is um, sealing its borders in 1912 and in 1910, putting ordinance 610 um, on the books, you start to see the beginnings of this notion of desirable neighborhoods and blighted neighborhoods versus um, undesirable native neighborhoods and thriving neighborhoods. And so all of these things culminate in Baltimore in about the mid 50, in about the mid 60s. And then you start to see a, pop, a city with a population that was roughly 1.2 million people in mid 1950 slowly decline um, to what it is today, which is about, I think, 650,000 as of the last census. So you have a city with all of this housing stock, all of these structures, but half of the population. And so how do we get what things, what factors kind of um, contributed to where we are today. And many of them are listed, some of the, the more prominent ones are listed in front of you and we're gonna discuss, um, discuss them. So when we talk about, you know, white flight and, and now what we see is also uh, what I like to call the black following. Right around 19, um, right around 1960, during the time of the civil rights movement, Brown versus Board, um, the Voting Rights Act, you see a, a, a slow and then even more um, speedy decline in Baltimore's white population. This also is tied to the GI Bill and the presence and uh, of loans for veterans to, to purchase homes, as well as uh, those federally backed back FHA mortgages coming into use at, at the same time. And subsequently, this is the end, the 1960s is the end of, of the great, what we would call the great migration out of the deep um, South and out of the, all from the rural and westernmost areas into the city, into the city, into Baltimore City and the surrounding areas for, for black folks. Now, if you look in the last several um, years, the last two decades, we're seeing what we call the, what I call the black following, which is working and middle-class um, black folks leaving the city because of a number of issues that um, from physical prop, um, blight to the damage that other things have done to the fabric of society in, in Baltimore. So the, I like to use maps because it, it really gives you a feel. So in 1950, um, this map on your, on your left um, basically shows what Baltimore's housing department considered to be 
neighborhoods or areas that were had blighted conditions. And then on your right, you see the federal housing um, security maps. And it's a curious, um, the areas that were redlined in the 1950s, because this is a 1950 um, map, and the areas that housing, um, city housing considered to be blighted are the same. So we already, as early as the 50s, um, see a correlation between the color of the people who live in a particular neighborhood and the physical condition of the particular neighborhood. So we move forward and talk about disinvestment, like how properties physically um, don't have the same level of service in terms of streets, in terms of schools, in terms of recreation, in terms of retail shopping, even in terms of new the, the turnover of old buildings into new buildings. This um, map is from the Baltimore Business Journal. Uh, they said Crane Watch. And you can see that even now, the areas that we have come to, to know um, based on Dr. Brown's work um, as the white L are receiving much more uh, public investment and private development. That is, you, you see it again, mostly when you, when you look at where the pilots and TIFs are. So again, you see that certain particular, certain neighborhoods are receiving both public money and private, in, um, private development, but those aren't the neighborhoods if you think about it, that had heavy levels of blight. So then it also another driver to uh, the condition of community today was the Federal Housing Act of 1955. Again, a lot of what has happened in Baltimore today can be traced directly back to the period between 1955 and 1965 in terms of policy decisions that were um, that were made. And so we, the highway to nowhere is shown very prominently. I don't know if you all can see my cursor here, but the construction of both the highway to nowhere, which was the failed uh, I-170 spur, as well as 83 and 395 displaced uh, residents, mostly low, low to working class folk, low income to working class folks, predominantly black folks out of the city. And in the, in the case uh, very specifically of Harlem Park and Poppleton left a scar that disconnected those communities in a particular way and set the stage for the slow decline um, to today. So again, this goes back to this idea of which neighborhoods are getting which kinds of investments. So this is the, the harbor place when it was still an industrial area. So instead of uh, the city fathers and, and the state putting money into developing neighborhoods that had already been experiencing disinvestment because of the because of redlining, uh, because of uh, blockbusting and steering, that money, those public funds and private um, private business was shifted and focused into developing the industrial waterfront as uh, many industries left Baltimore into a tourist into a tourist location that we now know it is the harbor and it's very interesting that the, even the notion of charm city comes out of a Baltimore being charm city comes out of the development of harbor place and it worked because in 1983, I believe it was, when the waterfront opened, it actually had more dis visitors that year than Disney World. But that money being invested in the downtown area on the industrial waterfront, choices were made to then not invest in historically black neighborhoods in East and West Baltimore. So another policy that kind of has led to uh, vacancy specifically property cycling in and out of the tax sale year in, year in and year out is, is how both properties are assessed in particular communities, like the formula by which the assessed value is created, is um, 
calculated and the process by which uh, property taxes are collected and if they cannot be collected, how properties are sold. And you can see the dis distribution, this was in 2021, I believe, the distribution of liens, of tax sale liens in Baltimore, it follows the same kind of pattern that you'll see, um, see with Dr. Brown. Okay, so I am at the 20 minute mark. So I'm gonna breeze through some of these things. What is the impact of all of what we have kind of discussed and all of what we know? Basically blight destroys community continuity. If, you, if you're the last person living on a block where everything else is vacant and, and falling down, you have no sense of community. You are left all to yourself. And human, human beings need each other. We do best when we have um, strong social bonds uh, with folks. It damages uh, wealth creation and generational wealth transfer. Most Americans' uh, net worth is tied up into home equity. Of course, if you have neighborhoods full of properties that are falling down, you're going to have lower home equity. And then the last um, impact is that it really does erode um, people's property response, the responsibility that people, that homeowners um, or property owners uh, display for their properties. They don't keep them in good condition as more and more properties fall into disrepair. So our perspective really is about collecting data from community about what community, how community wants to address many of the issues that you heard me speak about. Oftentimes, folks living in community with blight are told the data, they are told what the data means, and they are told how that data is going to impact policy uh, decisions and investment decisions. No one typically asks community what, what they want. And so we know that people with lived experience are going to have the most sustainable and the most equitable solution to any problem. And so our process is to develop a coalition uh, of the willing, I hate to use that, um, that um, phrase, to conduct a citywide survey to hear from folks who may not live in blighted neighborhoods anymore because they may have been displaced or they may have opted to move to other parts of the city for any number of reasons. So we want to hear from the city at large. Then we're going to host a series of community convenings and have, based on what we hear in the survey and what we hear in those community convenings, um, we're going to develop some smaller focus groups to kind of drill in and suss out the solutions that we want to put forward then we're going to develop a policy platform that um, that we can all mobilize uh, around. We talk about the focus groups. The policy platform will include both uh, policy and um, programmatic recommendations for the administration and for um, private investors, but also some tactics that we can take. Uh, to mobilize around around the particular platform. So I'd love to have answer any questions, have some discussion, but these are things that uh, in front of you that you all uh, might be able to do and we'd love to hear from you. Thank you so much, Nika. You're just at the time that we said we were gonna do. And I think Robilyn, uh, who's also with Fight Flight Be More, put the link to the survey. So the survey is open for people to take right now. Okay, and um, so hopefully all of you will take the survey now uh, or when you can. And um, is there a way for them to spread the word? How do they spread the word? Or uh, is it on social media or? So what it will, we are literally, this is the first time the finalized flyer is being seen. So we are happy to share it with um, Dr. Aya so she can distribute it to those who have registered. It will also be on our social media um, and is available via email if someone um, wanted to reach out to us directly. We probably have time for one or two questions in case somebody has any. 